Hello everyone, welcome back. In today's video, we got another news we're here to discuss. We're looking at the Stanley Cup final. The game four has now been finished. We'll see what happened there. We also got a couple of signs to talk about, injury updates to talk about, a change in the Columbus coaching position, and we've got some trade rumors to discuss involving the Blues, the uh, Maple Leafs, the Canes and the Jets, and the Senators and the Utah franchise. And we'll do all that coming up right now. Hello everyone, welcome back to another video here at the Unton Talk channel before we get this video. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe down below. Thank you for your support and able to with all of you guys. So if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe button down below. Don't forget to leave a comment down in the comment section below so let's discuss in today's video. Now once again we're gonna start today's video off by discussing the Stanley Cup final from over the past couple of days. So we had game four be played over on Saturday. Uh, Panthers had a chance to sweep, or they're trying to save off elimination. Uh, so it was an interesting game. And it was all Edmonton all the time in this one. Uh, early on, Yamark was able to get a shorthanded goal, making a one nothing oil. Oilers, uh, then Adam Henrique was able to make it 2-0 Oilers, then Tarasenko cut the deficit to 2-1 uh, with about halfway through the first period, but then Holloway would make it 3-1 with about 5 minutes left in the first period, that's the way the first period would end, 3-1 Oilers, it was looking really good, it looked like a tight game, but then the Oilers took off. Early on, Edmonton was able to make it 4-1 thanks to McDavid, at 5 minute mark it was 5-1, that was it for Bobrovsky, he was pulled, and then with about 7 minutes left in the uh, second period, RNH would score a PPG making it 6-1. Then Dylan Hollywood score 14-11 uh, to make it 7-1. And then with about four minutes left, McLeod would score to make it 8-1. And that was it. Oilers were able to absolutely destroy the Florida Panthers 8-1. to one. So it was a really impressive win there for the Oilers. Panthers didn't have it in them from the get-go. And this was a very fantastic and dominant performance there from the Oilers. As they save off elimination and force the Game 5 in Florida tonight. Uh, so that's interesting to note. If you look at the Oilers, uh, Connor McDavid had a goal and three assists for a 4-point night. And surprisingly, now has the most assists in the playoff run in NHL history. He's leapfrogged Wayne Gretzky with the three assists night. He now has 32 assists this playoff run, which is the most by a player in a playoff run in NHL history. So fantastic news there. Great to see McDavid break one of Gretzky's records. So that's fantastic. Uh, Holloway had a two goals and an assist for a three-point night. Yamark had a goal and an assist. Hyman and Drysdale both had two assists. And Henrique, McLeod, Nugent Hopkins, and Nurse also score for the Oilers in the win. With Harris Ankles, one goal score for the Panthers in the loss as they get their butts whooped by this uh, Edmonton Oilers team. So interesting to note there. We'll have game five later tonight. Now I think this might be one more of a one-off. And then look at the floor. Panthers were ready. It looked like they were definitely not ready. They pulled Bobrovsky, so he's got a little bit more rest going into this game. And I think the Panthers do wind up ending it in five. I picked it in six, but I think after the way that they got blown out, I mean, if you look at the stats, Bobrovsky's had three bad games, one in each series before this. Uh, so he had one bad game, losing 6-1, I think it was, to Tampa. He had a loss 5-1 to Boston, and he also had five goals against the Rangers, losing 5-4 in overtime. Each one of those games after the loss, Bobrovsky was able to bounce back and didn't really let him very much. So I think Bobrovsky is going to have a bounce back game. I think the Panthers are going to have a bounce back game. And the last time a Canadian team was down 3 nothing and won game four in the Stanley Cup final was the Montreal Canadiens. They're down 3 nothing to another Florida team in Tampa. They won game four, make it 3-1, and then they got shut out in game five. So I think there's a very likely chance Florida ends it here, wins on home ice, and he was able to lift the cup for the first time ever. But it was a really impressive game from Edmonton on Friday. And if they can bring the same intensity and are able to replicate that sort of a performance, we may be going to game six in Edmonton. We'll have to sit away and see. But that's an interesting game. And the Edmonton the Oilers will absolutely destroy the Florida Panthers 8-1. to So now we down 3-1 in the series. So interesting stuff there. Uh, going over to a couple of signings from the past couple of days. Some interesting ones from the past few days. Not too much, but there's a couple of decent ones. Uh, the Philadelphia Flyers have signed, signed Rodrigo Abols, who's a playing over in Europe. He gets a one-year uh, contract with Avia Sanders, $95,000 that will going to start next year. Uh, Bulls has been playing over in the SHL the past couple of years. Last year, had 19 goals and 41 points in 51 games. This year, had 14 goals and 26 points in the 50 games. Looks like a decent player. It probably will start at the AHL level. Could be a solid call-up option there for a Flyers. So, solid signing there for the Flyers to get someone on the contract. Then, in the Montreal Canadiens, since then, Oliver Kapanen, who was a 2021 second-round pick, he gets a three-year ELC with Avia 
received $925,000 that we going to start next year. Kapanen has been playing over in Liga the past couple of years. Last year, at 12 goals and 27 points in 55 games. This past season, had 14 goals and 34 points in 51 games. It looks like another solid prospect there for Canadians. Eventually, I think could be a solid bomb six forward, maybe even third line player. So, solid signing there for the Canadians to get a solid bomb six player signed for the next couple of years. Then the Philadelphia Flyers signed RFA Adam Jinning, who was a left-shot defenseman. Played mostly in the AHL this past year. Uh, also got into some NHL action. He gets a two-year extension with AV of $788,000 that we're going to start next year. Uh, Jinning last year spent most of his time in the AHL playing in 68 games, putting up three goals and 19 points. And also got into his first game of NHL action. This year had 58 games of AHL action, putting up two goals and 15 points, but also got into nine NHL games and put up a goal. So he looks like eventually could be a solid third player defenseman. So solid signing there for the Philadelphia Flyers. Probably starts in the AHL, but still a really good sign there for Philadelphia. And then we also saw the Tampa Bay Lightning sign left winger Gabriel Fortier, who has gone to some NHL action over the past couple of years. He gets a one-year contract extension with the AVS, $75,000 that we're going to start next year. Fortier is a solid player. Last year, played 67 games of AHL action, putting up 11 goals and 29 points. Also got one game of NHL action. This year, plays the entire season in the AHL, uh, put up 13 goals and 26 points in 62 games. So another solid season over in the AHL. I think eventually should be a solid bomb six forward. So it's a solid sign there for the Bolts to sign 48 for the next couple of years. But that's the only signings we have from over the past couple of days. No injury updates also to talk about over this period of time. So we'll get over to the coaching updates. Uh, there was an update yesterday on the coaching situation in Columbus. And that is that Pascal Vincent, like we most of us were expecting, has indeed been fired. Uh, Vincent was an assistant coach with the Winnipeg Jets from 2011 to 2016. He was then an associate coach with the Blue Jackets in 2021-2023. Then September 17, 2023, took over for the Jackets uh, as their new head coach after the whole Mike Bobcock situation. And then he was the head coach going into the new season. But Vincent never really worked out with Columbus. He made some weird coaching moves and he indeed has been fired. So I don't think this is too much of a surprise. Uh, a lot of people were expecting that with Waddell now being the new GM, he was going to want to bring in his own guy. And that's indeed what's going to happen. So Vincent after one year is out in Columbus. I think he signed a two-year deal to be in Columbus, so he's going to be not there for the second year of his contract. So interesting stuff there. And the Jackets are not going to have to go on a head coaching search. Now, there's still a lot of really good head coaches out there, including guys like Jay Woodcroft, Todd McClellan, uh, Dean Evison. So there's a lot of possible options there for the Jackets to go after someone. So I won't be overly surprised if the coaching search did not take an overly long period of time. But I do expect the Jackets to have a new head coach and not just the future so interesting stuff there but the Jackets have indeed fired Pascal Vincent and he is now no longer the head coach of the Columbus Blue Jackets and they are now in the search of a new head coach to be the new bench boss for next year so I'll have to see on that but that's another thing that Don Waddell is not going to have to do as the GM of the Columbus Blue Jackets and next going over to a couple of trade rumors now first up we have a couple of teams who might be open to moving the first round pick now we've talked about Jersey we've talked about Buffalo we know that they both want to move their first round picks Jersey a 10th overall for a goalie Buffalo the 11th overall for a scoring forward, but two more teams who seem to be open at the very least to moving their first round picks this year is the Utah franchise in Ottawa, and these picks are even higher. Now the Senators we know need some goaltending help, they can use a solid scoring forward. They are in the same sort of position as Buffalo, a team who's supposed to have been made the playoffs by now, but can't seem to get over the hump. So they need to try and also improve this team to try and get back into the playoffs. So moving the first round pick might make sense. They've had a lot of really high first round picks over the past little while now. It's seventh overall, so I wouldn't be overly surprised if they kept it, given the fact of how high it is and how good of a player they can get for it. But I think if there was a package out there to bring them either a starting level goaltender or a solid top six forward or something like that, I think they'd be open to moving it. So we'll have to wait and see exactly what happens there. Uh, I think there's a very likely chance that the Sens could wind up moving it. Uh, but I also wouldn't be overly surprised if they used it and drafted a player for themselves so we'll have to wait and see on that but the seventh overall pick apparently according to a couple of people i've seen does seem to be at least out there and if the right trade package comes along maybe ottawa moves it so we'll have to wait and see on that meanwhile for utah it's even higher they have the sixth overall pick so for them we know they're trying to make a big splash in the first season in utah trying to prove this team a lot better they have already been drafting so many times over the past couple of years now i don't
don't think Utah would just trade this pick outright. I don't think they would do that. But if they don't have a huge idea of who they want at the sixth overall pick and they don't have the guy who they wanted and he's been taken off the board, I could see them trade back and try and add some pieces. Now, I'm not exactly sure what they'd be looking for. They don't have any defensemen signed on their defensive core right now. Uh, their goal setting is pretty decent, but their forward group doesn't have a whole bunch of veterans either. So I think they could use a top six forward. They could probably use a top four defenseman. Could they move five, 10, 15 picks back, stay in the first round, and maybe get one of those things they're looking for? That's possible. Now, I'm not saying it's a guarantee they move this pick. Once again, sixth overall pick, really high draft pick. They could get a really solid player with that. So I'm not saying it's a guarantee Utah moves that pick, but I do think it's a possibility. So we'll have to wait and see on Utah and Ottawa, but on top of New Jersey and Buffalo, add Utah's sixth overall pick and Ottawa's seventh overall pick to the mix as possible first round picks that could wind up being moved. So we'll have to wait and see exactly what happens there, but it sounds like Utah and Ottawa, while not shopping their first round picks at this point in time, are open to moving it. And if the right deals comes along to get these two teams upgrades that they desperately need, I think there's a possibility they could try and move those picks. So we'll have to wait and see on that. Uh, going over to the St. Louis Blues, according to Frank Saravalli, they have made Brandon Saad available. Now, this doesn't come as too much of a surprise in my opinion at least. Saad's a decent player, but as cap it and his current contract, even though he's producing quite well, I don't think he fits overly well with St. Louis. He's a mill 6'4", I think at best in St. Louis. He's making $4.5 million. I think it's for this year plus next year, so he's still got a couple more years left on his deal. So not only will it be a hard trade to move, I'm not sure if teams would want him, but Saad can still, like I said, he's a really good goal scorer. Uh, he can put the puck in the net. He also has a lot of playoff experience from time in Chicago, so a team who maybe is trying to get back to the playoffs could definitely use a guy like that. So I wouldn't say it's a guarantee that he doesn't get moved. I think it's a possibility there could be some teams who could really value his expertise in the playoffs and his leadership role, but I'm saying it will be a difficult trade to pull off. I'm not exactly sure what the return will be for the Blues. I mean, Saad, like I said, $4.5 million for, I think, two more years. He's not looked overly great. He's definitely not the Saad from the past, so could they get maybe just like a second or third round pick for him? That would probably be the highest I think they will be able to get for him, so it'll be interesting to see, but the Blues, we don't know, also need some cap space, need some cap flexibility. Could also maybe move one of their defensemen, but it does sound like they would be open to moving Saad if they was able to get them some cap flexibility. So I'll have to see on that, but I could look at teams like Ottawa, Buffalo, Anaheim, Utah, uh, Calgary, teams who are on the cusp, who are close to making the playoffs, but are not there yet, who could definitely use another solid middle six scoring winger who could definitely help them push over the top. So it'll be interesting to see, but that's not like size available for the St. Louis Blues. After have to wait and see when he gets traded. Uh, going over to the Toronto Maple Leafs, we've had a lot of discussions about them over the past little while, and there's been even more over the last little while. So we know this Leafs team is looking for some major upgrades on the blue line. Two players that apparently the Leafs may have some major interest in and try and get in for agency will be Chris Tanev and Brandon Montour. Now for Tanev, it's not too much of a surprise. He's from Toronto. A lot of people do think he might wind up going to Toronto. Uh, he's probably going to want somewhere between 4 and $5 million on like a three to four year deal would be my guess. So it, it'd definitely be expensive for an older type forward and I'm not sure how well a contract like that could age. But I think that the least duty is sort of defensive defenseman like Tanev. I think he could be a fantastic top pair defenseman with Morgan Riley. And I think that could be a really good solid uh, addition there for the Toronto Maple Leafs. So we'll have to wait and see on that, but that's something that they have some interest in bringing Tanev in. On top of that, there's also some interest in bringing Montour in. Now, Montour is a solid top pair of defenseman, has been ever since he arrived in Florida. He looks really good, really good scoring abilities, but he's probably going to want six to seven million dollars. And with the Leafs and their current cap situation right now, I'm not so sure they'll be able to pay Montour what he can get on the open market. Now, could they have some interest? Absolutely. Like I said, he's a solid point producing forward. I think he had like 60 points last year. He had another solid season this year. Uh, he's a really good top four defenseman, could really look really well in like the second pair behind Morgan Riley. So I, I think that he would be a fantastic fit for the Leafs. But like I said, I'm just not sure if he's in the price range that the Leafs could be able to pay him. So we'll have to wait and see on that, but we know the Leafs have been rumored to be trying to add two top four defensemen, and it seems like guys like Tanev and Montour are two guys who have been linked to them, so we'll have to wait and see on that. And on top of that, staying with the Leafs here, uh, according to Darren Dreger, he was talking about this on a recent, I think, podcast or his radio show, and he said that at
at this point in time, Brad Tree Living may want to sign Marner more than he wants to trade Marner. So that's a little bit of a surprise in my opinion. I, I think he would be open to moving Marner according to Darren Drager, that's also what he said. After saying that, he said that if the right deal comes along and he does think that there could be a Marner trade that he could wind up being dealt. So it's not since a guarantee. He does think the Tree Living wants to sign him more than he wants to move him. So that's interesting to note there. Uh, I think Marner, if he was to sign for somewhere around where his cap it is right now, around like 11, 11 and a quarter, I think the Leafs fans will be all right with that. But given the fact he wants 13 plus million and wants to be right around Matthews, I don't think the Leafs can do that at this point in time. And I don't think they can handicap themselves that much. So in my opinion, I think there's a very likely chance that Marner still gets dealt. Now whether it does wind up happening in the off season or maybe it happens in the early parts of the season or maybe it doesn't happen at all and he goes to free agency, I'm not exactly sure. But as much as I think Trey Living wants to sign Marner to an extension, I just don't think it's feasible for the uh, Leafs at this point in time. And I think it's more likely that the Leafs wind up moving him. And there's also been some speculation, I'm not exactly sure where I've heard this, but I've seen it pop up a couple of times that the Leafs and the Islanders are talking on about a major trade that could involve Marner too. So I could see that be a possibility as a possible trade. We know the Islanders need goal scoring. We know the Leafs need a top end uh, defenseman in a trade package. I think the Islanders may be willing to move Ryan Pulak with how well Dobson's been playing over the past little while. Maybe that's the sort of trade that could work out for those two teams. I have seen that a couple of times. And as much as Drager did say that Trey Living wants to keep Marner, I have heard the Islanders pop up around a potential Mitch Marner trade. So we'll have to wait and see on that, but it's possible we could see Marner to NYI, but if not, then it's very likely that we see the uh, Leafs wind up keeping Marner, and maybe he stays for the rest of the season and doesn't sign him. So I'll have to wait and see on that. And lastly, going over to a potential one-for-one -one trade between the Winnipeg Jets and the Carolina Hurricanes. Now, I've seen this be mentioned a couple of times too. Uh, apparently, the Jets do have some major interest in a guy like Marty Natchez. Uh, the Carolina Hurricanes could have some really good interest in Nikolai Ehlers. I've seen a couple of people mention that these two teams should hook up on a one-for-one -one trade to send Ehlers to Carolina and Natchez to Winnipeg. Now, I think that will make a little bit of sense for both sides. We know the Jets could definitely use a solid top six winger. Uh, who could really work well on the line with maybe Shifley or on the second line. I think Natchez could definitely be that guy. He's a solid top six winger, really helps out that group. I think he could really turn really well, and I think uh, seven years at seven or eight million dollars, I think just will be open to signing into that. Meanwhile, the Carolina Hurricanes are going to be losing a solid top six forward in Natchez, so they need someone who can really help fill his role back. And Ehlers is a really good forward. He's a top six forward, can score 25 goals, can score 50 to 60 points on a good year. So I think that could be a really good trade for both teams teams, but I'm not sure if it'd be a great trade. I think Natchez at this point in time is a better player than Ehlers. Ehlers is a bit older, I think he is. Plus, he's a, almost a pending UFA. So I think if this was to happen, it would have to be some more pieces included on the Winnipeg Jets side to give to Carolina. But I do think this could be a basis of a really good trade to send Natchez to Winnipeg and to send Ehlers to Carolina. So I'll have to wait and see on how this goes. But I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on all of this. That's all I'm going to talk about for today. On all the things we discussed here today, uh, what do you think about this Ehlers uh, Natchez proposed trade could it be a one for one deal or do you think there have to be more pieces involved and do you think these two teams could hook up on a deal uh, what about the Leafs could it go after Montour could it go after Tanev do they sign Marner or do they try and wait him out or do they trade Marner could the Islanders be a landing spot uh, what do you think about the Blues does Brendan Saw get moved and if so what sort of team do you think could try and acquire him and what do you think about Utah and Ottawa could they move the 6th and 7th overall picks for upgrades and if so where do you think they could try and move them to definitely love to hear guys thoughts on that plus what about Pascal Vincent being fired, the signing updates, and Edmonton blasting Florida, but Florida still having a chance to clinch the cup final tonight. Definitely have you guys thoughts on all of that down in the comment section below. So I'm going to talk about for today. I'm going to tell you this video. If you like to remember, subscribe down below. Thank you for your support and able to fill up. If you guys, if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe button down below. Don't forget to leave a comment down in the comment section below so you can all discuss today's video. I do a blog talking about news, rumors, analysis of that, so if you can check that out, leave a link in the description below. And I count to see you guys all for next video. See you guys soon.